uh, so we'll, we'll kind of work through all of the different parts of this um, together. Um, so again, I've drawn up there, up above, shows what the recording might look like for a few um, of the stimulations that you'd give during the baseline period. In reality, you give hundreds of them, and you keep track of the size of each with a little dot over here, but each dot over there corresponds to one time you stimulate the presynaptic cell and the size of response you observed in the postsynaptic cell. Um, then there comes this period of time when you're ready to, to make your synapse get stronger, and so you zap the heck out of this presynaptic input um, hundreds of times per second, um, give it a little burst, then a break so the cell doesn't die, then give it another burst and a break and so on, and you keep doing that for a few minutes. Um, and during that time, the postsynaptic cell is going bonkers because it's getting so much excitatory input. Um, then you leave the system alone for a minute or so and let everything sort of return back to its resting state. So this postsynaptic cell is going to get my, back to minus 65 millivolts. Then you come back and you give one stimulation to the presynaptic axon and you see a response. Another one, maybe you see a failure that time. Another one, maybe you see another response. But if you look across, again, hundreds of stimulations over the next 30 to 60 minutes, um, on average, the size of the response is larger. Um, and this is, we care about this because um, it is uh, the, the thought to be the main way that you learn and remember things and build associations between neurons that represent different ideas in your head by strengthening the connections between them. Um, okay, and so what I've drawn up here is essentially the first three questions from the, from the assignment. So during the baseline period, Sometimes you get failures, which means that the presynaptic cell doesn't release. If it does, you're going to see a postsynaptic response. But like that middle one up there, the presynaptic cell just didn't release anything. I drew a time when the presynaptic cell does release, so its vesicle had some other vesicles filled with glutamate, but one of those fused with the membrane and glutamate got released into the synapse. Um, and so this glutamate is going to bind to our AMPA receptors, it's going to bind to our NMDA receptors. Um, and so what happens to our AMPA receptors when the glutamate binds to them? Yes. They open. they open up. Awesome. Sodium comes in, a little bit of potassium comes out. Yeah, and that's why we see this depolarization. What about the NMDA receptors here? You already got a turn. Somebody else gets a turn now. Yes. They're the plug. Yeah, they open up, but there's this big fat magnesium ion plugging them up. Right. Nothing coming through. All right, cool. Um, next, while we're zapping the heck out of this, action potential is coming like crazy um, and, uh, and we're getting release many, many times over. Um, so again, whenever there's release, glutamate binds to the AMPA receptors and they open, sodium comes in, and the combined sodium buildup and voltage buildup over many, many stimulations is why our postsynaptic cell is firing. That's temporal summation. Um, NMDA receptors, do they bind the glutamate here? Yes. Uh, what's going on with our magnesium ion? Is it in there? No, no it's all gone. Magnesium ion's floating off over here um, because the postsynaptic cell is not negative enough to attract it and make it want to try and squeeze in through that NMDA receptor. So instead, stuff can flow across our NMDA receptor. We get some sodium flowing in, a little bit of potassium trickling out, but very importantly, um, some calcium comes in here. Um, so. There's also going to be, so if there's some axon coming off of here, every single time there's an action potential in this cell, there's going to be calcium coming into the presynaptic terminals that this cell makes. But if we were simulating these other inputs and not this one, this was not part of the question, but let's say we have an NMDA receptor here, but what we're doing is we're dry, simulating action potentials on this, this cell fires its own action potential. Calcium comes in out here. The NMDA receptors here are getting glutamate. They're going to be unplugged because our calcium ion's gone. Or sorry, because our, because our, because our cell's firing action potential. Um, this NMDA receptor here, it's unplugged. The magnesium ion's gone from it. But because the presynaptic axon that is associated with this receptor is not active and not releasing glutamate, that NMDA receptor channel is closed, even though the magnesium ion's gone. So we'll be getting calcium up here into these, into these parts of the dendrite, but this part of the dendrite 
has no calcium in it. And as a result of having no calcium in it, this synapse is not going to get stronger, but these other ones are. And we kind of want that, right? This was the, the whole cells that fire together and fire in synchrony with each other. We want them to become associated. If this input is not firing at the same time as the output cell, we don't want to strengthen that. And the way we accomplish that is because there's no glutamate. Even though the magnesium ion's gone, because this postsynaptic cell is firing, there's no glutamate. Does that, are there questions about that before we kind of return to the, the a little assignment that everyone just did? So, so you need both glutamate because whatever presynaptic cells associated with that synapse needs to be releasing and, and, that, and that's how the NMDA receptor opens and you need a postsynaptic action potential to get that magnesium ion gone so the NMDA receptor is unplugged. And only at those synapses where both those conditions are satisfied are you going to get calcium coming in. Yeah. Wait, okay, but why do they close? Uh, why does the NMDA close again? So over here, there's no glutamate in this synapse. There's glutamate being released here, glutamate being released here, glutamate being released here. This postsynaptic cell is firing an action potential. The magnesium ions are gone from all of its NMDA receptors, but only some of its inputs are active. Okay. And only some, and therefore only some of its inputs have glutamate at them. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a very common place where people get confused about this. Questions, more questions about that. I'm sorry, what, what is this? So what is this, this was not... You have, you have the glutamate, right. uh, and you have the postsynaptic cell firing action. You have glutamate at these inputs, but not this one that we care about right now. Okay, and uh, then the postsynaptic cells can still fire. Because so enough of the other inputs are active. Either if there's other inputs or if there's inputs from CA3. Right, is that the yeah. Answer? Yeah, that, and, and, and only the ones, only, only those connections, only a connection, so, so in order for a connection to be strengthened, the presynaptic cell for that connection and the postsynaptic cell for that connection need to both be firing. And that's accomplished through the molecular mechanism of the NMDA receptor. Um, it needs glutamate from the presynaptic axon that touches it, or comes up next to it, to open, and an action potential in the postsynaptic cell to get unplugged. And if, that, if the glutamate is at other places along the dendrite, then, though, then, then this one's not going to be getting calcium in to it. Did that, does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, there's no glutamate there at this synapse that we're sort of keep paying attention to. Did you have another question about that? Or? Uh, I'm still somewhat confused. For you. Why is there a CA1 for CA3 on the other side? Uh, oh, right. That was that. That's, sorry. I, I, I was confused. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I think I got them all right now. Um, oh, except uh, I have the wrong one up there too. See, this is this is uh, this was me pushing through. So yeah, so we're recording from our CA1, which is our postsynaptic cell, um, and then this is stimulating CA3. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay, I think I got them all right now. Is everything straight now? Sorry about that. Okay, so back to the question. Um, after LTP, again, we've simulated, now we're simulating this axon one at a time. We simulate it once, glutamate comes out. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes we get a failure, like that second one up there that I drew. But on the times that it does, it's going to bind to these receptors. We get some current flowing in through our AMPA receptors. That's why we see a response. Um, what's going on with our NMDA receptors here? Are they passing current or not? Who thinks that they are passing current? Who thinks that they're not passing current? Okay, good. A lot of people raised their hand. Nobody really wanted to volunteer, but yeah, they're not passing current. Um, why not? Sure, yeah. Plug back, up. Plug back up. Magnesium ions come back, back in there. As soon as we got back down to minus 65, that magnesium ion came right back in. They're plugged up. But our average response is stronger. Okay, and so before we talk about why the average response is stronger, what other questions do people have about any of this? Yes? So during the stimulation, the NMDA receptors are open and unplugged. Right. The AMPA receptors are also open. Yes, yeah, they're also open. Yeah, because whenever there's glutamate there, that's all they need. They're, they're, they're sort of simple receptors. They just need glutamate. Um, the NMDA receptors are more finicky and need two things. Um, sometimes we call the NMDA receptors coincidence detectors because they detect when the pre and postsynaptic cell are 
firing at the same time or coincidentally with each other um, at the same, same, same instance in time. Okay, what other questions do people have about that? Before we, yes? So does that happen if the cell is, like the postman cell is firing because of other inputs, but it's still wired to within? Um, if it's firing because of other inputs, but there's no glutamate coming out here, then the NMDA receptors are going to be unplugged because the postsynaptic cell is firing, but closed because there's no glutamate there. So there might be glutamate up on some other part of the dendrite that we're not looking at here. And so calcium's coming in there, but, um, but if, there's no, if there's no glutamate coming out here, then there's no glutamate sticking to them and they're going to be closed up. Um, but um, if, so, so we get the LTP by stimulating the heck out of one input, you could also get it by stimulating more inputs all together. And then the association of those multiple inputs all firing together can drive action potentials in one target cell. And then all of those will get stronger. And any others that you're not stimulating won't get stronger. Does that, does that help a little bit? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's worth spending some time with. Um, there's often a lot of times that people do get confused about these points. So, they, um, so if you're unclear at all, I would highly recommend reviewing this. Um, yeah? Um, could you please explain the last situation in the receptor a little So we've got, we simulate our axon, glutamate gets released. Sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, we don't see anything. But then glutamate binds to the AMPA receptors, and they open. They're just simple receptors. All they want is glutamate. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, the NMDA receptors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, so the NMDA receptors. Um, so our postsynaptic cell over here is at minus 65 millivolts. Maybe it gets up as high as minus 63, minus 62 or something. Um, over here, our postsynaptic cell is firing action potential, so it's fluctuating between minus, uh, maybe between minus 50 to plus 30 millivolts. So it's spending a lot of its time in a voltage where the magnesium ion's not, a, not uh, in the way. But then back here, our postsynaptic cell is right back down to minus 65 millivolts. And so that means there's an electrical force pulling our magnesium ion back in. And so, and so it tries to fit in through the channel. It's too big to fit in, so it just plugs it up. Okay. Yeah, sure. Wait, so during, um, it goes from voltage of negative 50 to positive 30? Yeah, because it's firing action potential. So it fires an action potential. Then it, 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 might, it spends a little bit of time maybe at negative voltages too. But I thought, it, I thought it just got to a less negative. All right. No, yeah, no, we, no, we're getting action potentials in our postsynaptic cell. All right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yes? So those little bumps, yes. um, those are not full action potentials? No, those are not action potentials. Those are excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Um, so yeah, the little bump like this goes from minus 65 up to peaks out at... Um, say minus 68 millivolts. That means that the size of this is 3 millivolts. So we'd go over here and we I didn't label my axis, but we'd put a dot right here at 3 for that. Um, and an action potential is 100 millivolts in amplitude. So this is way, way smaller. We call these um, excitatory post synaptic potential or just for short, EPSP, um, which means that, again, we're exciting our cell. We're getting it close to the threshold. We don't excite it enough to make it fire in this case, but we do sort of, we're trying. We're moving in that direction. It's postsynaptic, and it's a potential because we're recording in the receiving cell, recording the voltage in the receiving cell. Yeah, did you have another question? Yeah, so for number three, when you say, how is this situation compared to one, you go for both at 65 or negative 65 it's the same as one. Yes, yes, yeah. So a lot of people in past years have been confused about the fact that it's the same as one, but for the, as far as the NMDA receptor is concerned, we're in the same situation that we were in number one. Yeah. Yeah. How does a cell like, unlearn, right? So um, if, a simul if, a, if a synapse gets unused for a long period of time, then it will weaken. There are other mechanisms for that, and that's probably uh, the, the long-term depression, and that is probably the mechanism for unlearning. It, it's probably even more complicated than that, but we'll sort of stick with that for now. Yeah. Yeah, other questions about this? Okay, cool. So now, what can be changing? So, um, uh, yes? We're talking about magnitude, or are we talking about Negative 65, shouldn't it, like, if it's going up, be like negative 62 or 
Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. My I bad. Sure. Yes. Okay. No. Uh, yeah. No. No. That's 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 my. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's it's, it's yes. Yeah. I'm 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 terrible. I'm terrible with pluses and minuses. If you haven't learned that by now, then you haven't been paying attention this semester. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. It's 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 more depolarized, more positive. Yes, closer to the threshold. Yes, thank you. Other questions? Okay. So, what can be changing? Um, so, first option, um, if we in in the time between before and after, um, if we put more voltage activated calcium channels here on our presynaptic membrane, our, yeah, presynaptic membrane. Um, could that make our synapse stronger on average? Who thinks yes? Who put yes down for their group? Who put no? Didn't didn't put it down for their group. A couple people put no. Okay, just uh, do you want to say why you thought maybe not? No, you don't want to say. You want to say why you thought yes? Um, well, I, I thought those because uh, you get like higher possibilities. Yeah. So so more so possibilities. So more voltage activated calcium channels. Um, and if we do that, then that will increase the probability of release at our terminal, right? The, the, the key thing that determines whether or not on a single tri trial we get glutamate going out is the probability of vesicles binding, which it is determined by how much calcium is there and how sensitive the vesicles are to that calcium. Um, and so if we, give the, if we get more calcium coming in here, again, calcium in here happens every action potential. Calcium in here, you need release, which is a probabilistic event. You need postsynaptic depolarization, which means you need strong stimulation. You need, you need glutamate there. There's a whole lot of criteria that you need for calcium in here. Calcium comes in here every time. Um, but if we get more calcium in there, that's going to increase the probability of getting vesicles out. And as you did on that long homework assignment, if you increase that probability, then that will increase the average response. And that's the whole thing we're going for, right? Is we're looking, is we get, the, we're, we've got a higher mean. And we know that mean equals N times P times Q. So one or more of those things has to be changing. Okay, what about if we leave the presynaptic calcium channels the same, but we change the proteins on the vesicles so that they're more sensitive to calcium? Would that, who thinks that that would help make increased release? Who thinks that would not? Okay, a lot of people raised their hand. Anybody want to volunteer why they think it would? Uh, sure, yeah. Again, you're increasing probability. Yeah, again, you're increasing probability, right? So we make more, um, so we make, um, more sensitive vesicles. Again, up, increase P, and that's going to increase mean. Okay, what if we add a bunch more NMDA receptors to the postsynaptic cell? Um, what's that going to do? Um, who thinks nothing? Okay, who thinks something? Increase. Okay, so uh, you want to say no? You don't want to say why you think? So who wants to volunteer why they think yes, uh, why they think nothing will happen with that? Um, sure, yeah. Well, like, not nothing, but it'll, like, increase, like, the rate at which yeah, so in terms of, yeah, what we're interested in is the average response to a single action potential in our presynaptic cell. And as we just sort of worked out, that single action potential doesn't care and the response doesn't depend on the postsynaptic NMDA receptors. I could put one in there, I could put a thousand in there, I could put a billion NMDA receptors in there. Um, for one action potential, they're all plugged up, and so more NMDA receptors is just not going to do us any good. Yeah? <laughs> Only if we get depolarized enough, and we're not going to get there unless we have way more than one synapse active. Yeah. So again, we're just curious about changing the response per one action potential um, uh, in, our, uh, in our presynaptic cell. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's a, that's a question that often throws people off. Um, okay, so what about if we had more, more AMPA receptors? Anyone want to comment on what will happen there? Yeah, sure. You, you raise your hand. So I get to pick on you now. Yeah, so if you have more AMPA receptors, we get um, more 
current coming in through the, because these AMPA receptors don't care if the postsynaptic cell is depolarized or not. Um, and so that means more postsynaptic depolarization, um, which we just, that, and so that means that we've increased what we call Q, the postsynaptic response to a single quantum or a single vesicle of neurotransmitter. Um, and that will increase our mean as well. We've increased our postsynaptic sensitivity. Okay, um, what about option E? Is our synapse stronger because the NMDA receptors got unplugged and so now they're contributing to the postsynaptic response? Anyone want to make a comment about what they came up with with that? Let's see. I'm going to pick on somebody who hasn't talked yet today. Um, sure, yeah. What did, you, what did your group come up with for that? We said no because the NMD receptors immediately plug up. Like yeah, they yeah. They, they, just like we worked through, they plug back up, and so, and so they're, they, are, um, they are not unplugged, and so this whole thing falls apart. Not, they don't contribute to that postsynaptic response. Um, okay, what if we build more connection points? What if we create a new branch on this dendrite, and this new branch connects up over here, would that make our average response stronger? What do you think? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, that's, so those are our options for strengthening for what can cause this long-term potentiation. Okay, questions about that? Yeah, sure. How do you increase the sensitivity of the... Um... You can um, add chem phosph... You can chemically modify the proteins. Um, yeah, make some mo minor chemical modifications that can affect them. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so, great. Um, one of those options, actually, we're going to say, even though it works mathematically, is unrealistic. Um, and this is something that I, that you know, I would not have. Yeah, you should. You shouldn't have worked through this on the homework unless you're like way, way ahead and you've taken cell neuro or something. Um, so, an increase in n, or in other words, build a whole new contact point, a whole new synapse takes hours to do. So in the five minutes that we stimulate the heck out of this and then let it recover and then ten minutes later we're recording it again, it's already stronger. And so in fact logically it works to have more contact points but there are sort of physical limitations that prevent this. So, um, yes, but it takes too long. Um, is, is sort of the, 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 the sort of caveat to that. And so really, our options are down to either more calcium channels on the presynaptic terminal or more sensitive vesicles or more AMPA receptors postsynaptically, or some combination of those things. Does that make sense? Are there questions about that? Okay, so in, in fact, actually, um, this whole debate that we're going to be diving into for the course of the next week or so um, revolves around, is it a presynaptic change um, or um, a postsynaptic change? Um, and I'll say, or maybe, or maybe some combination. So we're going to sort of combine either more calcium channels or more sensitive proteins, kind of say that, that those are combined into something that's changing probability of release presynaptically.
So I'm just curious, um, at this point, now that we, have, we haven't really looked at any data, we've just sort of worked through what happens with LTP. Um, so you have to vote, or I call on you about why you didn't vote. Um, so everyone needs to vote, but I don't, but I don't care what vote you, vote you make. Um, so think for a second about whether you think it's most likely a presynaptic change, um, in, in increase in P through one of those two mechanisms, most likely a postsynaptic change because of more ampere receptors, or maybe a mix of some more ampere receptors plus one of the two presynaptic things. So think about that for like a couple seconds. Okay, so who votes? Who thinks that it's probably a presynaptic change that's uh, causing LTD, LTP, mostly or entirely presynaptic change? There's no right or wrong answer. I'm going to count two hands because I saw hands start to go up um, and then, and then uh, nothing. Okay, who thinks it's mostly postsynaptic change? Okay, like half the class-ish. Who thinks it's some combination? You better all raise your hand if you didn't raise it before else I'm going to be calling on people. So about half the class again. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we're, now what we're going to do for the rest of today and into <coughs> the rest of the semester, sorry, another semester, the rest of the unit, is talk about some data behind some of these theories. Um, so the, 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 the Two people who um, were most in favor of the idea that there's a postsynaptic change with long-term potentiation um, are these guys, Roger Nickel and Rob Malenka. Um, they have, um, between the two of them, um, trained probably half of the people who are do doing um, neurophysiology and running their own labs, doing, uh, doing synaptic physiology um, over the past 30 or 40 years. Um, uh, I was trained by someone who was trained by Rob Malinka. Um, half the people here were either trained directly or indirectly by one of these two people. Um, and, and sort of around the, around the world, um, they've, they've been dominant forces in the field of neurophysiology. Um, one of the people who worked with them um, uh, in the late 80s into the early 90s is Julie Cower. Um, she has um, gone on to build um, a, a strong reputation of her own, understanding plastic plasticity and how it affects things like addiction um, and has uh, her own research um, that she's done um, at a few different universities now um, looking into the neural basis of addiction. And so, um, as I said a couple slides ago, and as you can get from the title of this, while Julie Cower was in Roger Nickel and Rob Malinka's labs, um, while the three of them were working together, um, they came up with a study which they thought indicated that a postsynaptic change is what is causing long-term potentiation, what's responsible for long-term potentiation. So, to unpack that a little bit, what they're saying is, Long-term potentiation means more AMPA receptors. That's, that's, their, that's their sort of hypothesis or the, 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 the main idea of this publication that we're going to be talking about for the next 10 or 12 minutes. And to figure out or to provide evidence that there's more AMPA receptors, they sort of went with um, an interesting logical approach that, that is very clever but also a little bit subtle. So they sort of went with the, let's test our, the, the other idea and prove it wrong approach. So here, again, we've got a synapse, postsynaptic cell, some AMPA receptors, some NMDA receptors. If we do an experiment under conditions where there's no magnesium around, so this is the only time in the whole, it's, I, so I'm going to confuse everybody because we just spent forever talking about how the NMDA receptors get plugged up by magnesium. Now we're going to do an experiment with no magnesium. So our NMDA receptors are unplugged all the time. Only in this experiment does that work. And, um, and so, yeah, be sure that you sort of caught that, um, or else you'll be lost for the whole rest of this, the unit. Um, so, so we've got no magnesium around, so our NMDA receptors are unplugged. So their idea was, well, if there's a higher probability of release, then what we can do is we can put on a drug called CNQX, and this drug blocks all of our AMPA receptors. It's an antagonist that blocks all of the AMPA receptors. And then what they're going to do is they're going to measure the response through NMDA receptors. So this is in the presence of this drug, CNQX. The AMPA receptors are blocked. So now they're measuring NMDA responses. And their logic was, well, if there's a presynaptic increase in the amount of glutamate coming out, then after we do LTP, should there be the same response 
or bigger response or smaller response to this? So I saw smaller, somebody said bigger. Who thinks that, so, so, the, so the idea is if we're getting more glutamate out, we've got these NMDA receptors, now they don't care about magnesium, they only respond to glutamate. So if there's more glutamate coming out, are they going to respond more or less? So a couple of people, why do you think less? Yeah. That's that's it's yeah. It's going to be less than if the AMPA receptors are there. But what we're saying is we're comparing this situation before versus the same situation with again AMPA receptors blocked, NMDA receptors after LTP. So we're, comparing, we're not comparing before and after the block of the AMPA receptors. We're comparing um, size of the response we get through our NMDA receptors when, when their magnesium ion's gone, but the AMPAs are taken out of the picture. So if we put more glutamate in, and these NMDA receptors don't care about voltage anymore, they only care about glutamate, then what should happen to the, size, the, the, the average size of response that we get from that? You, you had... Do you want to, why do you think it's going to go up? Well, it should increase because if you have more glutamate, it's just going to have a higher postsynaptic response. Yeah, so, so if, we've, if, we're, if we are in, so their idea was, well, if we're wrong and we're getting more glutamate out, then after we do LTP, we should see a bigger response in our NMDA receptors, right? Um, another way to say that is, People who believe that LTP is caused by a presynaptic change think that there's no more AMPA receptors after than before. The only difference is more glutamate. And the synapse comes pre-built with this beautiful glutamate detecting device right here. Um, if we can just get that magnesium ion out of the way, we can measure and infer how much glutamate is coming out by how much activity we're seeing through our nice glutamate detecting device that lives right here in our synapse already there. Okay, that's, that's, I think, often a confusing point. What questions do people have about that? So, in other words, if LTP is presynaptic, then afterwards, so beforehand, our probability might be 0 0.4, and afterwards, our probability might be 0 0.8. And so, um, the number of NMDA receptors isn't changing. The number of connection points isn't changing. Um, the amount of current that flows through our NMDA receptors every time the vesicle happens isn't changing. So our Q is constant because we've got the same amount of NMDA receptors. Our N is constant. And so then if P goes up, what's going to happen to the mean response? It's going to go up, right. So then they said, okay, so let's do that. And if they do that, then in fact, they try LTP a few different ways. We don't need to worry about the different ways that they try doing it. But they try LTP a few different ways. And in fact, they see no change. And so from that, they infer that there is no... Um, uh, more glutamate, no higher probability of release. The mean response before is the same as the mean response after. So, um, so to them, that means that it's unlikely that, um, there's more glutam that there's more glutamate coming out. And so they say, okay, well, probably what happens is some more AMPA receptors snuck in, but we had this drug on, so they got blocked as soon as they snuck in, and so that's why we don't see any increase in the, in the postsynaptic response. Okay, um, what questions do people have about that experiment and the logic of it? <coughs> okay, yes? I'm just curious how they block the amplifiers. They have a drug, um, CNQX, that they just put in with the... So, so, so um, yeah, so this is done in... Um, actually, all of these experiments are done in isolated chunks of hippocampus, and they're kept alive by washing a salt solution that mimics cerebrospinal fluid on them. And so they just added to that salt solution this drug that blocks AMPA receptors. 
Um, and that's actually a really common way to sort of figure out what different, um, what different things are doing is by putting on something that will block their function um, as, you, as you're doing these experiments. Yeah, yeah, great question. Other questions about that? Okay. I'm sure there are questions about that. So rather than me rambling more about other things, um, we've got about four minutes left. So take those four minutes and either on your own or in a group, um, either on the back of the last sheet or on a fresh sheet of paper, whatever, um, summarize the experiment and their results and why they think it means postsynaptic change. And then also, either from this paper or anything else that we've talked about in this unit, point out either what's most confusing or ask a question. Um, and you can do that as a group or individually, whatever you prefer. Um, and so, yeah. experiments that we didn't talk about that say if you block, if you use a different drug that blocks MDA receptors, you prevent long-term potentiation from happening. Yeah. So then why did they even do tetanus? Um, well, because they figure the NMDA is still working just fine, and so if we do that, if we do that high frequency stimulation, then, and there is some signal that goes back and turns up presynaptic release, then all that should still work. Yeah. But then if, there, if there's no magnesium, then just that like a normal... Yeah, um, right. Um, so I sort of glossed over a little bit. Um, what they actually did wasn't remove the magnesium. What they actually did was depolarize the cell just enough that it's 10% of the receptors at any given moment have magnesium off of them. Um, and, so, um, and so it's enough that you can see a response, but not enough that that's going to cause LTP. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
it, it, that following that logic is, 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 is like, uh, it's hard enough to just follow the idea of this one, I think, so, yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's, there's, a, there's maybe a little less than a minute left. Um, as you finish up, please come to the front and turn in both the, the worksheet and your summary. Um, if it's on the back, that's fine. You can just do it all as one thing. If you did your summary or separate sheet, turn that all in. Um, and then anybody who didn't get their exams last class period, those are up front as well. On Friday, you need to bring the exam reflection assignment.